In this documentary, I'm going to show you how the landscape of smoking and the use of nicotine is changing so fast in Australia that it appears that even our government is struggling to keep up. Is Australia going up in smoke? They might think, oh, I'm going to smoke now, but when they get older, they'll think, oh, I wish I didn't smoke. Why on earth would you do that? We know that smoking is bad for you. It says it on the packet. Everyone here would know that two-thirds of Australians who smoke are helped to an early grave, not just by carcinogens, not just by toxins, but increasingly in a nation where we will not contemplate alternatives, where the rest of the world does. It's all about the science, and wouldn't there be no debate? There would be no debate. But there is a debate, because it's not about the science. It is, a, it is an ideological warfare. It's clearly not an on-ramp, and the Australian government's own evidence it's not an on-ramp. E-cigarettes are a gateway to get off smokes, not to get hooked on them. New Zealand put us to shame this week by legalising e-cigarettes. The UK has openly trialled them and even developed locations for vaping around hospitals. And the USA, though freely available as they are, across the EU. Salute! Australia! Australia set to go up in smoke. What's your favourite sport? Snake, Hi. animal, kangaroo. And what's your favourite car, Australia? Holden! Let me see that's football, meat pies, kangaroos and holding cars, huh? Right! Well, you sure sound like Australia to me! It became part of our culture. They gave them to our soldiers. We couldn't even go without one. Or playing a violin. Or singing a song. Fifty million times a day, Australians light up and like it. To smoke a mild, good-tasting cigarette, they're particular about the brand they choose. In a repeated national survey, doctors in all branches of medicine, doctors in all parts of the country were asked, what cigarette do you smoke, doctor? It was a far different time when addiction seemed like a foreign word. Aussies of that era would simply light up in their droves. It was the normal thing to do, to sit down and enjoy a cuppa with a Winnie Blue. But they sold them on the tally. It's a right clean cigarette. Have you tried them lately? They are better than ever. Forward looking people look for the latest in modern living. Look to Edinburgh, a trend setting blend of rich, rewarding tobacco. Silver King with soft smoke. Smooth, mild, much more satisfying. We loved our cigarettes. Although there were murmurs that they might not be good for us, we still smoked them. Today, the Royal College of Physicians published their report on smoking and lung cancer. They say, conclusively and authoritatively, that cigarette smoking is a cause of lung cancer, causes bronchitis, and contributes to coronary heart disease. It's a grim report. They say, for instance, that I, as a cigarette smoker, have one chance in three of dying before the age of 65 whereas a non-smoker has one chance in six. 
Therefore, a non-smoker has twice as much chance of living to the age of 65 as I have. For some weeks now, tobacco shares on the stock exchange have been falling in anticipation of this report. But will it be enough to stop a habit that has become part of our national life? It took us nearly two years to listen to the warnings. In 1964, as 43% of us kept on smoking, there was some hope with a new plan to quit smoking. It was the five-day plan. If you undertake the five-day plan, you must obviously want to give up smoking because you're proclaiming to other people, and more important to yourself, that smoking is for you a problem and one that you cannot solve alone. The five-day plan didn't work for everybody. Even in 1967, we began liberating women with them. Heaven forbid. You come a long way, baby, to get where you got to today. Introducing new Virginia Slims, the slim cigarette for women only, tailored for the feminine hand. In 1972, when smoking was 40%, we still loved our smokes, as it became ingrained in our culture, as much as we loved our sophisticated man hey, hoax. I've been asked to talk to you, see, and being a suave, sophisticated man about town, I thought I'd do the job with a bit of, you know, polish, a touch of class. So I'll get the boys back here to set the scene with a bit of the old mood music. Uh, when you're ready, Boris. Anyhow, what I've got here is a new brand of cigarettes, Winfield. Have a good look at them. Now, you might say nothing extraordinary about that, but I've got news for you. And if you're a smoker, it'll be the best bit of news you've had in 10 years or more. But these new Winfields are 40 cents. That's about the price you should be paying for a good smoke. But never go at the length of them. This would have to be the best cigarette value in Australia today. No risk. No risk. It was 1978 as the rates of death and disease increased. It seemed the message from the Royal College of Physicians was falling on deaf ears here in Australia. A rebel group called Bugger Up had other ideas. So we thought, oh, damn this, you know, let, let's form a public interest movement. So we formed Mop Up, movement opposed to the promotion of unhealthy products. We uh, theatrically, I think, held our first meeting in the lecture theatre of the city morgue. <laughs> They said, we've been going out spraying billboards. And they said, OK, your mop up, we're bugger up. And billboard utilising graffiti against unhealthy promotions was officially born that night as well. Mm -hmm. I'm a bull for a cigarette. Lord, I'm a bull for a cigarette. Eventually, billboards were being painted all around Australia. Cause I wanna smoke it. Lord, I'm a fool for a cigarette. They raised the boards and bugger up countered by filling paint bomb balloons. The Bugger Up Rampage went on from 1978 to the early 80s. Many were arrested, but it was effective. Most of the people in Bugger Up have worked for years through the so-called correct channels and uh, it's literally been a bang your head against the wall exercise. Conservative governments aren't interested in acting with any force against the tobacco industry because they are dependent in some sense on revenue being brought in. And I think that uh, ordinary citizens who can make a statement are making it in ways like this. Despite this drastic campaign, Australia still continued to turn its back on the health warnings coming out of the Royal College of Physicians in England. You know, the British Medical Association and our own medical associations have tried all other kinds of approaches and we feel they're ineffective. <laughs> we're breaching the law, but we're not breaching medical ethics. In fact, I believe it's a medical responsibility to take this kind of action. 
It would take till 1994 till tobacco advertising on billboards was finally banned. TV advertising was banned in 1976 in Australia, but it didn't stop cigarette companies becoming a big part of our much-loved passion for sport in Australia. is that the, uh, the evidence, the scientific evidence that's being produced is not uh, conclusive in relation to a causal connection between smoking and human health. Australia kept smoking, but eventually we caught up a little and began launching a huge amount of quit smoking ads across our screens like these. Every cigarette is doing damage. Lungs are like sponges with millions of tiny air sacs for transferring oxygen. It was so funny, Dad. You should have been there. When you smoke, you inhale over 4,000 chemicals. It's a toxic, poisonous mix of substances, including ammonia, the bleach in toilet cleaner, acetone, the chemical in nail polish remover, benzene, found in paint stripper, and hydrogen cyanide, used in rat poison. And smoking delivers it straight into your body. Uh, Michael Roberts, 49 years old, married, and I've got four children. And I've got CAPD or commonly known as emphysema. No, I can't go more than a few hours without a cigarette. I can't go more than a few feet without the oxygen tank. I'm only a social smoker. I haven't been out of this room in weeks. If this is how your child feels after losing you for a minute, just imagine if they lost you for life. Bring out the cancer-producing tar that goes into the lungs of a pack-a-day smoker every year. This is how much you'd get. As you may know, cigarettes have been linked to cancer, addiction, emphysema, heart disease and premature death. And as a result, we at My Tobacco Company are introducing a total product recall. All of our product will be withdrawn from sale wherever it is in Australia until we can guarantee that it poses absolutely no threat to your health. Because if there's one thing we care about here, it's your health. <laughs> Tobacco advertising was something we started to make jokes at. No country in the world has got smoking down uh, as far as we have. Sorry Simon, you're wrong. There's lots of countries that have outperformed Australia. According to our most recent survey, Australian smoking rates are at 11%. But that's wrong too, and here's why. When you include smokers 14 and over who have smoked less than 100 cigarettes per year, it becomes 14%. Let's skip back to 2011. Politicians like Bill Shorten became frustrated as he saw a huge economic burden on Australia emerging. Two and a half million Australians smoke every day. This number is simply too high. We need to do more. It's a drain on our health system and it's a drag on our economy. Over the next 10 years, smoking related health and economic costs are going to top $300 billion. We want to reduce the number of people smoking. Costs of smoking now burden Australians $137 billion 
every year. My name is Dr. Alex Wodak and I'm president of the Australian Drug Law Reform Foundation and I'm the director of the Australian Tobacco Harm Reduction Association. Smoking damages people's productivity. Um, they have twice the amount of sick leave as a non-smoker. Um, they retire early, they don't work, they're not able to do as much work as a person who's not smoking. We, we lose, believe it or not, 8 million people a year from smoking around the world. 8 million people. We lose 21,000 people a year in Australia from smoking and about a third of those deaths are in people of working age. Uh, they're under the age of 65 or 70. Um, so this is a big issue in Australia. It's uh, almost 10% of the burden of it, what's called the burden of illness. That means a, a way of combining deaths and disease together. It's the most important cause of preventable deaths and disease in Australia, smoking. So anything which uh, reduces uh, that burden is going to be a great benefit, health, social and economic, to Australians. Um, I'm Colin Mendelson. I was a GP for nearly 30 years and now I work exclu exclusively in, in helping smokers to quit. So I, I work in tobacco treatment and I'm a director of the Australian Tobacco Harm Reduction Association, a health promotion charity. Over the last seven years, the decline in Australia, Australian smoking is one third of what it is in the UK and the US where vaping is available. It makes me feel sick to know that so many parents, dependent children, are still smoking in Australia. And this is another whole aspect to smoking that isn't emphasised nearly enough. And that is that uh, smoking is spans the economic and social spectrum, that's true. But it's also very much concentrated in low income populations. So the, uh, the lowest income 20% of Australians have twice the smoking rate as the smoking rate in the most privileged Australians. In Australia, in the last three years, there was no fall in the smoking rates in the over 40s. Uh, and that's a very much at risk group, which are going to have lots of problems if they continue to smoke. The focus really has to be on increasing the quit rate of middle-aged and older smokers biggest declines were in the 20s and 30s. And what's interesting is that's where most of the vaping is occurring. And to some extent, the rise in vaping matched the decline in smoking. And that's, that's an interesting signal to us, I think. The smoking rates are higher in people with mental illness and they increase with the severity of the mental illness. So about one in three people with anxiety and depression uh, smoke. 60% uh, of people with bipolar disorder and 70% of people with schizophrenia smoke. The highest smoking rates actually in people with substance use disorders, which is about 75%. People with mental illness smoke more heavily as well, and they're more addicted, and it is harder for them to quit. But they are as motivated to quit as, as other, other smokers. Um, and unfortunately, they're not offered uh, treatment in the, in the same way or as often as uh, other smokers. But uh, they respond to the same treatment as other smokers, although their quit rates are lower. And they should be given treatment, but perhaps with a bit more intensity and support. From a health point of view, this is very important. And it's no accident that the Royal Australian New Zealand College of Psychiatrists Psychiatrist was the first major profession, health professional group in Australia to uh, peel off from health establishment groupthink in Australia and become supporters of vaping. And the reason for that is that psychiatrists work very hard to see that their patients with severe mental illness, bipolar, schizophrenia, whatever, severe depression, uh, whatever the mental illness was, they would work very hard with these people to try and help them with their mental illness, only for many of these people to die prematurely from a smoking-related condition because smoking and smoking heavily is so common 
in people with severe mental illness. And so the College of Psychiatry in 2018 in Australia said this is nonsense. We should be allowing people to, to vape and encouraging people to switch from smoking to vaping. We've had two deaths in recent years um, of people, uh, mental health staff, who were killed by patients uh, who were mental health patients who desperately wanted to start smoking and were not allowed to smoke in the mental health premises. We had a, a cardiac surgeon in a hospital uh, east of Melbourne in Box Hill uh, who was uh, who cautioned uh, somebody to uh, not smoke in the hospital grounds and that person beat up the surgeon and killed him. So smoking in Australia is, is increasingly concentrated in disadvantaged groups. So people in rural Australia in remote areas smoke at twice the rate of those in metropolitan areas. Uh, and there are disadvantaged groups like low income groups. Uh, my name is uh, Clyde Bates. I became the director of Action on Smoking and Health when uh, you know, I basically got into the, the, the tobacco and uh, nicotine issue. From there, I moved to be a civil servant and I, I, I was um, in Tony Blair's strategy unit to have no conflicts of interest with respect to the tobacco, nicotine or any other uh, relevant industry as far as this discussion is concerned. You see a sharp disadvantage uh, or socioeconomic gradient in smoking and that, that's ultimately a, a really important driver of health inequalities. I think in England, they estimated that half the excess premature mortality in poorer groups was associated with smoking prevalence. In fact, in the last three years, the rates of smoking in women have not declined at all. For many people, even with severe alcohol and drug problems, um, smoking is the reason that many of them will die prematurely. And I was staggered to see that lung cancer was such an important cause of death in people uh, with alcohol problems. And of course, the reason that people with, who have a drinking problem die from lung cancer is because of their smoking, not because of the drinking. People who use substances and homeless people who have much higher smoking rates. Smoking kills more Aboriginal people than any other drugs and alcohol combined. The highest smoking rates though are in, in Indigenous people who have smoking rates of, of about 43%. And that really is a, a national tragedy. Uh, and the gap between Indigenous smoking and the smoking from the rest of the community is not decreasing. And we have a lot of work to do there. I'm Marty Glover. I'm a professor of public health and I have my own centre now, Centre of Research Excellence. High rates of smoking among colonised Indigenous people and mainly it's colonised Indigenous people, is historic. So first off, in terms of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in Australia, their smoking of tobacco predates uh, the arrival of uh, Europeans and colonisation. So they were already trading with the, uh, you know, th with a the Asian communities um, off the top of Australia. And then also there was the use of pituri, which is a native uh, plant to Australia that has nicotine in it. So that's one of the historical reasons there was, it was already being used. And then with colonization, and this is the thesis of my center, looking at the loss of sovereignty really, or the relationship of sovereignty, if you lose power and over your life or the your autonomy your ability to impact your life and your health and your well-being of of yourself and your family 
then that's where we see increased smoking rates. There's a big difference between New Zealand and Australia in terms of reducing Indigenous smoking rates is that we make up 15% of New Zealand, of the New Zealand population. We have over 20 MPs with Māori uh, ancestry in Parliament. We have uh, myself, a uh, Māori you know, professor of public health. And in Australia, the, the situation is very different. Uh, the proportion of the population of Indigenous and Torres Strait Islander people in Australia is much lower. It's very, very difficult to, for them to uh, influence the white Australian dominated government and policy making. Of course, there's like what happened to me that, you know, they just won't be allowed. Uh, they won't be given a platform. They will be, they'll be silenced. They'll be threatened. And I've actually, you know, I've witnessed this where Aboriginal people have been threatened and an organisation was threatened with losing their funding if they allowed anybody to talk about vaping at their conference again. So there's really corrupt stuff going on. I don't know how, um, you know, the Indigenous people just have no voice. From 1 July 2012, cigarettes will have to be sold in plain packaging, the most hardline packaging regime anywhere in the world. It's not often a court case on the other side of the world makes headlines in Canada, but this one could have an impact here. The Australian government has won the right to bring in the toughest cigarette packaging rules in the world. And that has anti-smoking advocates in Canada calling for similar action. Well, the government is celebrating a groundbreaking win for its plain packaging cigarette laws in the High Court today. Joe Costrich, GP, health industry consultant, author and chairman of Australian Tobacco Home Reduction Association. Look at the rates of cigarette smoking, you'd have to say that it has had a negligible effect um, in terms of the number of smokers. And that's probably not really surprising. Um, two reasons for that. Number one, People use a whole lot of illegal substances, which all come in plain packages. So people um, essentially, if they are smokers, they will continue to buy the cigarettes, whether they're in plain packages or not. It really doesn't bother them. They're not buying it for the packet. So I said to them, it's the, the same results. I try to smoke when you are, uh, and they close your eyes and smoke <laughs> because the effect will be the same. Smoking causes mouth cancer. Sales of cigarettes have not particularly been affected. And it could be the case, could be the case, that some of the graphic warnings that used to be on cigarette packets were more effective than plain packaging. Putting it in a plain package um, gives a warm and fuzzies to the, um, the latte sippers and uh, people who inhabit university uh, ivory towers. They feel like they've really achieved something. They pat themselves on the back and not so much these days, but previously they'd fly around the world at the front of a plane telling their colleagues how clever they were, aren't we clever? Or oh, we've really done something that upset the tobacco industry. They don't like uh, pictures with their tongue or uh, like, that, like that guy who, who looks like dying, okay? We'll be proposing a measure which will see the cost of uh, a box of cigarettes, a packet of cigarettes go up by about $10 over the next five years. Know what this is. This is just another tax. Uh, the government is promoting this as some kind of a health measure. Wrong. It's a revenue measure. It's just another tax. So let's not listen to this palaver uh, about health. This is all about revenue. It's all about tax. It's all about a government that can't control its spending. That's why it hits you in the hip pocket. Cigarettes are about to burn a much bigger hole in smokers' pockets. A 12.5% price hike will make the cheapest packs $29 or more than $10,000 a year for a pack-a-day habit. One top brand will hit almost $49 or more than $17,000 a year. The increase will kick in in September. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for smoking. Uh, my name's Sam. I have a YouTube channel where I review e-cigarette or vapor products. Smokers are a massive cash cow for the government. $17 billion is what they're going to make in a financial year from smoking. The government is making money off of death and they quite clearly don't want to lose that $17 billion because they know their economy is fucked. And that is disgusting that our own government is putting public health secondary 
to GDP. I make the rules around here, so I'm going to tell you where you can and cannot smoke. I'm over 18. It's legal. I know. Just give me some money. Now I'm going to hide your cigarettes and make them even harder to buy. But you still want my money. I like my taxes. Give me some more. Now, I'm going to remove all branding so every pack looks the same. You do realise I'm an adult and I can make my own decisions. Just give me the money. Do as you're told. I'm not in the business of defending smoking. I want to make that absolutely clear. But I also want to make it absolutely clear uh, that this is not uh, a health policy. Uh, this is a tax grab. The more you increase the tax, the more you harm these people. And it's been said a number of times that they may well either A, uh, go without food or buy cheaper food, or perhaps their children don't get to eat as much because they'll buy the cigarettes. Or, um, and it's it's fascinating the people who, who put their hands on their hearts and say that they're progressive and interested in, in helping the less fortunate seem to be the ones who take the most glee um, in jacking up the price of cigarettes. It's, it's quite strange. The fault we can't fall into is going for full prohibition because mm -hmm. prohibition creates corruption and, uh, and organised crime and, and a whole run of, of other things. The, the great misconception in pro prohibition is that if you ban something, um, the supply goes away. And, you know, we should know that from, you know, the supply of illicit drugs. Um, you know, it, it doesn't go away. It just reforms around the prohibition with an illicit supply chain. Scientists have their sights set on stubbing out tobacco use for good. The new CREATE Research Centre at the University of Queensland is looking at a range of proposals that could dramatically slash cigarette supply, including reducing the number of tobacco retailers and ending cigarette sales to everyone born after a certain year. And the way they're going with the prohibitionist goals, uh, they are just going to make things worse because their intent is to criminalise people who smoke. You've seen it with alcohol uh, in the 1930s. Uh, you've seen it with cannabis and the war on drugs in the United States. Uh, prohibition doesn't work. It's never worked in any capacity. Bhutan is a great example because it's been the sort of poster child paradise of tobacco prohibition and banned all tobacco, sale of all tobacco products in uh, the early 2000s and have sort of tried to intensify that ban ever since. But WHO reported on it last year and they had to admit that tobacco use prevalence in Bhutan is still around 24% of adults unequally shared between men and women and that the supply chain is now run by Bhutanese youth who are amongst some of the heaviest tobacco users in Southern Asia. So, you know, <laughs> You've got the worst of all possible worlds in what is supposedly the model tobacco prohibition environment. Some um, dinosaurs of tobacco control who wanted to achieve a lot more, who believe that they can, but time's running out and they have to shift to really, really heavy hitting punitive stuff to achieve in their lifetime what they, they wanted to have as their legacy and they are prohibitionist in intent. The other option for these people is to go to the black market, and we know that happens, where either um, they, they're doing something that's illegal, and that obviously you know, increases the risk of fines or going back to, uh, to jail, and or they, they're getting substances where um, they don't necessarily know what's in it. The illegal tobacco trade is a lucrative business, so much so the amount of prohibited product arriving into our country in the past three years has quadrupled. There, there is quite a vigorous, dynamic black market for tobacco in Australia. Aids on shipments from Indonesia to Sydney netted 70 tonnes of tobacco, worth $40 million. Here, alarm bells, with close to 270,000 packages found. That's around 400 million cigarettes. All up, that equates to more than $600 million in tobacco tax that's being dodged. And it's just worth it for the price. even though they're pulling 
the conventional levers of tobacco control harder and harder you know really ramping up the tax i mean to quite eye-watering levels now but people are just getting to the point where that's not effective anymore because they're going around it the black market or growing their own or whatever so some of those things in conventional tobacco control have run out of road and in england we've taken an additional and better approach to this which is enabling more people to respond to the signals coming from tobacco control policies cigarette prices in australia are the highest in the world in absolute terms um, no doubt that's uh, the major factor that is stimulating the growth of the tobacco black market in australia i'm brian marlow and i'm the campaign director for legalized vaping australia Legalised Vaping Australia is Australia's largest grassroots advocacy body uh, in support of legal vaping. Uh, we account for about 70,000 subscribers in our database all across Australia that want to see vaping legalised. And we're essentially the, the group that represents consumers and vendors. People think that nicotine is extremely harmful. So when they hear nicotine vaping, they think that nicotine is the harmful element in cigarettes that will kill you know, tens of thousands of people. We demonise nicotine and now we're paying the cost. Even doctors, even nurses think that it's nicotine that causes the cancer. They think it's nicotine that it's highly addictive. It's, it's nicotine and that's not true. You are going to consume nicotine. You may as well consume it through a product that doesn't kill you. Uh, and we see that. There's patches that put nicotine through your skin. There's gums. There are sprays where you can spray nicotine directly into your mouth. So we've made the assessment as a group, uh, you know, as, as Australians, that nicotine, whilst not ideal, isn't that deadly and can be accessed in order to help you quit smoking. But not if it comes in, you know, a flavour you may enjoy, or not if it comes in a way that we're not quite, you know, across. Uh, it, it's absolutely ridiculous. Uh, some people think that two drops of pure nicotine is enough to kill an adult. This is linked back to some dubious studies in the 19th century where people were self-experimenting on themselves. It, a lot of the stuff out there is not scientific and the truth needs to come out. So what is nicotine? It seems it's a very misunderstood substance. Did you know that you may have consumed nicotine today? in your tomatoes, your eggplants, your potatoes, and maybe another fruit and vegetable, as it's a naturally occurring pesticide found in a lot of naturally grown produce. You may eat potatoes every week. Doesn't mean that you're addicted to nicotine. It's all about the levels of nicotine. In low dosage, nicotine can in some situations even be beneficial. But let's not take it from me. Let's learn more about nicotine from a doctor. Nicotine's a natural chemical in the tobacco plant, uh, which acts as an insecticide. Um, it's released into smoke when the tobacco leaf is burned and it's carried very quickly to the brain where it releases um, a whole range of chemicals and hormones, mostly dopamine, uh, which creates pleasant effects, um, a relaxing, pleasurable experience. Nicotine is addictive, but it depends on how it's delivered. Uh, so nicotine in tobacco smoke reaches the brain very quickly and in very high doses. And over, the time, over time, the brain changes um, and it needs nicotine just to feel normal. So when nicotine stopped, um, smokers get uh, nicotine withdrawal and cravings as a result of a drop in their nicotine level. But also with smoking, there's other chemicals in the, the smoke that increase the addictiveness of, of nicotine. So it, it is the most potent form of, of, of nicotine in terms of addiction. But in other delivery systems, pure nicotine is much less addictive. So we know that from uh, patches or gum and from vaping, uh, nicotine is not released as quickly and it's, it's actually far less addictive. And if you're a non-smoker, uh, it can be very difficult to get addicted to nicotine from those sources. There are a lot of benefits from the use of nicotine and we need to take those into account when we're assessing risk from nicotine. So we know that it improves concentration, uh, improves attention uh, and short-term memory. 
it helps to uh, control weight. It keeps uh, weight down by reducing appetite. Um, in the short term, it helps to relieve uh, anxiety and depression. And it's been shown to be beneficial in preventing and reducing the severity of a range of medical conditions, particularly schizophrenia, but also Parkinson's disease, uh, a bowel condition, uh, ulcerative colitis, and attention deficit disorder. Whoa, 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 whoa. I thought nicotine was the worst thing ever. Nicotine is very misunderstood. It's the most well-known chemical in tobacco smoke. So people have assumed it's deadly like smoking, when in fact it isn't. Uh, we now know that it's the other 7,000 chemicals in tobacco smoke that cause almost all the harm to health, not nicotine. And in the low doses used in, in, in smoking and vaping, it has relatively minor health effects. It doesn't cause cancer, it doesn't cause lung disease, and it has only a minor role in cardiovascular health. So what are the best ways to quit and quit for good? Seems like going cold turkey seems like you're going backwards. Cold turkey does work for some people. I mean, I've come across people who've said to me, I just threw away the packet. And, and they have. And, and back in the, in the 1970s and 80s, before a lot of uh, quit smoking aids were even invented, a lot of people did stop smoking even going back to the 60s. So it is possible for that to happen for some people. Uh, the best way to give up smoking is uh, is to give up smoking. It's cold turkey. That's what the majority of evidence uh, shows. But each person's different. So each person is when we go down to an individual level, and that's why we need to facilitate access to methods, whether it's chewing gum or uh, patches or, or e-cigarettes. Well, I just decided to quit smoking and then and then that was it and I never had a cigarette ever since I decided no no more. Well, maybe maybe to those people the strength of the addiction is nowhere near as high as with other people. Well, it's one way of quitting but it's not the most effective way of of quitting because it's got to actually work for people and research has shown that it doesn't effectively work. Well, the first method I tried to quit smoking was cold turkey, of course. And, you know, this lasts for anywhere between a few hours to maybe a couple of days. Uh, but once again, especially if you have friends who smoke, it's, it's so difficult. I mean, you'd have to completely destroy your circle of friends to, to give yourself the sort of environment to, to be smoke free. Well, the real facts of quitting cold turkey is that you're lucky to be able to quit the first time you try and the rate of being able to quit cold turkey is between about three to five percent at best. And then I switched to the nicotine gum and that worked. I went from the four milligram to the two milligram, but I had horrible heartburn. I actually had to start taking medication for the heartburn that I was having from the nicotine gum. <laughs> If you're over 12 years old in Australia, you are of legal age to purchase nicotine as high a strength as 21 milligrams from your local chemist, from your local supermarket. This style of products available in gums, lozenges, patches, inhalers and more. They are available in cool berry flavoured spray inhalers. At best, a 10% cessation rate at 12 months is all that can be expected to be achieved with any of the nicotine replacement therapies. But they're not without risk. In fact, there have been many recalls of MRT products. You will also see that they are conveniently merchandised at such a height that they're perfect for a toddler to simply grab and chew their new nicotine gum. It really begs the question of whether they're taking the safety of children seriously here in Australia. So what other solutions are there to stop smoking? Well, maybe we could rely on Pfizer, the same company that bungled up many scientific experiments without the consent of parents in Africa and 
with other bungled experiments around the world, leaving kids either deformed or dead. Because apparently when science wins, that's Pfizer. But let's have a look and see how reliable their leading smoking cessation product is called Champix. I tried the Champix first and uh, yeah, like that almost made me go insane. Just a massive amount of depression because my body is just going through this withdrawal. There's, there's, some, there's some sort of subconscious thing going on where it's like, I'm doing the thing that usually works. And now this thing isn't even working to give me any sort of relief. Um, I, I, I just remember those were some of the darkest days of my life on, on Champix. Mom, I love you with all my heart. Peter, you're the best brother I can ask for. I know it doesn't make sense right now, but it's for the best, trust me. I'm losing my mind, I'm going crazy. I love you both. It just hurt too much. Timothy Oldham was 22. Next to the tape recorder, he'd left a box of the quit smoking drug, Champix. He'd been on it for eight days. Even as far back as 2008, Pfizer knew that there were hundreds of deaths reported with the use of Champix. Yet they still continued to market the product across Australia, resulting in Tim's death and unfortunately, not only him, but many, many more Australians and those across the world. Death isn't the only side effect. There are also a further growing list of side effects from this drug. It still continue to be sold across Australia, even now in 2020. Pfizer even tested Chantix on adolescent smokers, but failed. It's even recommended by many quit programs. In 2010, the Therapeutic Goods Administration had more than 200 reports of suicide-related events for Champix patients. But as you can see, there's no warning on the outside of the packet, and when you open it up, there's nothing inside either, because the Australian law doesn't require that. No. Uh... So I, I just had to stop taking it. I mean, I was starting to have some really dark thoughts and it's like, Jesus, you know, this could be doing more harm to me on a emotional, mental level than the actual tar and cancer causing agents of the cigarettes were. So I, I stopped taking the Champex and I started back smoking again. Maybe big tobacco may have a solution considering they started the problem in the first place. Back in 2003, they invented a system called the Accord. It wasn't really popular though. Maybe you're wondering, what is going on in there? Here's the deal. Each time you take a puff, a computer chip tells the lighter to light just the right amount of tobacco without setting it on fire. So the cigarette isn't burning up inside the lighter. And since it doesn't burn in between puffs, you can take as long as you want before you take another. Take a puff, answer the phone, feed the dog, have lunch. It'll still taste fresh when you're ready. Maybe Big Tobacco may have an answer with a smoke-free new reduced harm product that landed in the market around five years ago called the Iquas. Proving they're really serious about getting into the smoke-free tobacco market, Philip Morris International have allocated $7 billion towards this product. You're not inhaling the products of combustion of tobacco smoke. These things are gonna be one to three orders of magnitude less risky than smoking. Most of the harm from smoking comes from the products of combustion. So what you want to do is have as many options as you can that fall into that highly reduced risk category. And, and heated tobacco products are one of those. Look, interestingly, the FDA in America has formed a different view as has the regulatory authorities in Japan. Um, Essentially, what we know is that 
burning or combusting of tobacco is what causes diseases. It liberates a whole raft of noxious chemicals that lead to, to cause cancers, uh, leads to heart disease or contributes to heart disease, airways disease, you know, the list is a long one. Heat, not burn products such as Iquos, don't do this because it doesn't burn the tobacco. Um, so interestingly, the evidence was, was uh, accepted by the FDA in America. Uh, it's been accepted by I mentioned, you know, the authorities in other jurisdictions, including New Zealand and including Japan. Um, but apparently the TGA here um, has a different view to its colleagues in all the rest of the world. So I suppose either we're right and everybody else is wrong, or maybe everybody else is looking at the science and we're just taking an ideological Now, stance. we've seen amazing progress, for example, in Japan where the, the, the volume of cigarette sales fell by uh, about a third over four years following the introduction of heated tobacco products in Japan. They happen to have captured the imagination of Japanese smokers. But a one third decline in cigarette consumption is amazing. And the iCross is now available in 49 markets across the world. It's said to contribute to the lowest smoking rates in Japan since 1965. So somebody's now offering them, companies are offering them an option, greatly reduces the risk of that. And everyone in Australia, in the public health community, seems to have you know, manned the barricades to stop that happening because it's coming from a tobacco company. It's insane. It's absurd. True that the TGA recently in Australia um, rejected the uh, heated tobacco products, uh, so-called ICOS of Philip Morris International, but um, the Food and Drug Administration, in a very much more rigorous and a much more uh, open process, um, accepted uh, ICOS, and they accepted it because they agreed that the the arguments for harm reduction. Um, were uh, much were very persuasive. I should say that this was a very long and a very expensive process in the United States, um, but um, even so, we can, I think, have much more confidence that the Americans made the right decision to allow uh, ICOS to be sold in and the heated tobacco products to be sold in the United States. Um, if you if you if you just oppose everything you do, everything a tobacco company does because it's a tobacco company, you're also opposing anything that these companies do to change the product mix to make it make it less risky. And that's essentially what they're doing in Australia. They're saying we don't care whether these products are much less risky if they're made by the tobacco industry. And that is a really dumb way of thinking about the evolution of technology from combustibles to non-combustibles, from high risk to low risk, because you're putting yourselves, the public health people are putting themselves in the way of that natural evolution of the market. People don't want to die of cancer. They don't want to have, you know, live in misery with COPD or get struck down by a heart attack. So perhaps the most pedantic regulator in the world, the Food and Drug Administration of the United States, has declared that these products are appropriate for the protection of public health and has allowed the manufacturer to say that you will get greatly, uh, greatly reduced risk of exposure uh, to you know, the main hazardous chemicals associated with smoking. Um, but the TGA won't even let it on the market. And where, what is the difference? What is the difference in the evaluation that happened in the United States and the, uh, and, and the evaluation that happened in Australia? I'll tell you what the difference is. It's lobbying from the public health groups. It's nothing to do with the actual underlying science. However, where we're at now in 2020, with still roughly 13% of the Australian population smoking, uh, these people have often tried cold turkey, they've tried the quick line, um, they've done a, you know, a whole host of other treatments, they might have tried prescription medications, they might have tried patches and gums and sprays, and despite all of that, and all of these mechanisms work for some people, I'm not saying that they don't or that they should all be replaced by, uh, by vaping. But there are a number of different options for different people and vaping is one more option for people who have not been able to quit with some of these other options. So, so what is vaping and will it get us off that rock in a hard place?
Tobacco in conventional cigarettes is burned, and this produces smoke that contains thousands of poisonous and cancer-causing chemicals. E-cigarettes work by heating and creating a vapour from a solution that typically contains nicotine. As there is no burning involved, there is no smoke. They do not contain any tobacco. Just nicotine, propylene glycol, vegetable glycerol and flavourings. The vapour doesn't contain carbon monoxide or tar, two of the most harmful elements in tobacco smoke. E-cigarettes aren't risk-free, but they are at least 95% less harmful than cigarettes. And they can help you stop smoking. E-cigarettes are the UK's most popular quitting aid, with almost 3 million adult users. Of these, 1.5 million have stopped smoking completely. Public Health England recently did a fantastic video that demonstrates why vaping is so much less harmful than cigarettes. Now, as they say, a picture is worth a thousand words, even my words, so let's see what they showed. Oh, it's just so revolting. Look at this. That's just the inside of the jar. Look at that lump of tar. That is what's going on inside your lungs when you smoke cigarettes. Now there's a bit where they cut the tube and oh, look at that. Oh, the tar coming out. And that's only after one month. This is what's happening inside our bodies when we smoke. Now, look at the e-cigarette results. Yep, just a little bit of vapor. There's only one that's really got much in the way of color and it just looks a bit wet. So this experiment shows you in a really easy and basic way Every cigarette you smoke causes tar to enter your body and it's the tar that contains the poisonous chemicals that spread through the bloodstream. Pretty amazing, isn't it? Remember, it's the tar and smoke that causes the health problems, not the nicotine. And there's no tar and no smoke in vaping. Um, I'm happy we have a legislation approving vaping products now uh, and it's still though defined, it's really like being allowed for cessation only. And, but it's much better than what you have. I'm sorry. <laughs> at least we got, at least we've got vaping. Uh, and it's, yeah, it's a harm reduction approach. It's a start. If you're jacking up the taxes or you're trying to sort of stigmatize smoking or, or, or those kind of things, Surely what you have to do is increase the number of options that smokers have available to quit smoking and, and adding vaping and the other, uh, you know, non-combustible options to that mix of options to quit smoking has made it easier for more people to take that step. And that is basically what they're doing in, in England. And of course, we're not seeing it in Australia, so we're seeing it flattening. We've seen the evidence building, which shows that vaping is actually more effective probably twice as effective as nicotine replacement products. So I, I think it's quite clear now that that's the most effective quitting method and it's also the most popular method. So, and that's important because people are using it and it's having a much wider reach at, at a public health level. We have these new options that weren't there before. Why don't you try them? And the, the National Health Service, for example, has been on the front foot in advising smokers, particularly disadvantaged smokers, to try these products, particularly if they've tried everything else before and failed, as, uh, failed to quit as they usually have, then this is a new option that should be tried. UK is, is a long way ahead of us in, in having vape shops in hospitals. And I think that reflects their acceptance of tobacco harm reduction. Uh, it would certainly be a good thing in Australia. Um, Hospitals are stressful places for people who can't smoke uh, and vape shops and vape supplies would be advantageous. So I think we're a long way from that in terms of our attitudes in Australia to vaping. About 1.2% to almost double in the last three years, despite the fact that most people in Australia who are vaping are vaping illegally. 520,000 vapors in Australia, which is quite extraordinary given the fact that it's it's officially discouraged, it's effectively illegal and banned in Australia. Clearly, people are finding that vaping's working, and and they're 
moving towards um, accessing vaping to help them finally get off the cigarettes. I tried all the traditional nicotine replacement therapies, the, uh, the gums, the sprays, uh, the patches, uh, even the little tabs, and um, all of them made me feel sick. Longer wheeze when I lay in bed at night time. I've quit smoking cigarettes. I was one pack a day for over 30 years. I've been able to breathe better, sleep better, function a whole lot better. Since I started vaping, I've had no health effects whatsoever in comparison to when I was smoking. It just works. I stopped 23 years of combustible tobacco addiction by vaping strawberry flavoured e-liquid that contained nicotine. I quit cigarettes for good with vaping. With vaping, I managed to beat a cigarette habit of 50 years. The only way I could ever give up cigarettes was by replacing them with something that didn't kill me. That's when I took up vaping and I haven't had a single cigarette since. That was four years ago. I'm a criminal for giving up smoking and, and becoming healthier for doing it. Do you still vape? Do you call it vape? Yep, I still vape and I'm technically a criminal as a result of that. Um, it enabled me to quit smoking. I haven't had a cigarette in, gosh, two and a half years now That's or something. Great, I feel fantastic. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. But it's basically got... Oh, we're not allowed to smoke in here, I've just been told. Oh dear, oh there you go, <laughs> just, just broken the law. Anyway. The laws governing the use of nicotine vary widely from state to state. So let's go across Australia and have a look at just how wide and varied the laws are. In Western Australia, fines up to $45,000. And all vape devices banned. <laughs> In Queensland, fines for up to $9,752. Plus, they have a Dobbin of Vapor hotline. In South Australia, all online sales are now banned. You could expect fines for up to $10,000. In the ACT, fines for up to $30,000 or even possible prison. In Tasmania, fines for up to $7,850 or also possible prison. New South Wales is a little bit more lenient with just a maximum fine of $1,100. In the Northern Territory, fines for up to $15,400 or prison. In Victoria, fines for up to $15,546. Let's have a bit of a think about this. If it was a health issue, why the heck are we finding, fining people instead of actually saying, well, listen, this is better for your health. Now, I'm a non-smoker. Now, I cannot sit inside a room with people cigarette smoking. But I've actually sat inside places where people have vaped and it's not that intrusive at all. Currently you can legally import your own nicotine, but about 99% don't, as you need to find one of about eight doctors across Australia to write a prescription for you. However, that is all set to change very soon. This issue is one that has now fast become an international embarrassment for Australia as we see a stark contrast here in Australia with bans on smoking in prisons resulting in riots as opposed to the US of A where vaping in prisons is encouraged. quite clear in, in England, the UK, we are trying to reduce cases of cancer, heart disease, COPD, emphysema, stroke, and all the nasty things that happen with smoking. We have understood that the vaping and other non-combustible products are an opportunity here to be exploited, not an overpowering threat to be resisted. And that is the broad difference between the approach in the UK and in Australia.
They are running public health campaigns encouraging people to take it up. Here, they're running campaigns to actually ban it, while at the same time, cigarettes, which we know will kill you, are available at every single corner shop, every supermarket, every news agent you can walk into, and there's what? More than two million people buying them. Two thirds of people will die as a result of, of their smoking. So oh, about, say, what, 1.7 million, something this, like that, 1.6 million, it, will die. And the one thing that could save them, and that every one of my friends who um, I've spoken to about, this is the only way they've quit. It's the only way I've quit. Uh, Public Health England uh, advertises vaping on television uh, as a way to quit smoking, and that gives people the confidence to do it. And therefore, we've seen, uh, you know, if you like, the, the, the sort of rocket burners turned up under smoking cessation because this new option has become available that reaches a whole load of smokers that weren't that interested before. And that's because it's quite similar to smoking in many respects, in, in actually in many respects other than the, the, the harm. Uh, you know, there's a hand to mouth movement, there's a throat sensation, there's flavors, warming of the lungs. Um, there's a, a behavioural ritual behind it. So in many ways, it fits neatly into the place that smoking fits for, for many smokers, and therefore they find it easier to move. The brick and mortar or the, the physical vape shop, uh, it's integral to people being able to find the products, firstly, to actually see and have access to them, but then secondly, uh, have someone help them find the product that fits them, um, the flavour that fits them. Um, all of the various components that go into a vapor product um, and a setup that's going to help someone quit. Often it's not you know, possible to be found online for someone who doesn't know what they're looking for. So having a vape shop there to explain to someone and help them navigate through um, the product range, it's, it's vital. It's often the case that vape shops are treated a lot worse than tobacconists, uh, which doesn't really make sense. I mean, tobacconists sell products to two and three long-term users and vape shops don't. Uh, but for whatever reason, across different states, uh, health department inspectors seem to be really cracking down on vape shops and telling them that they can't display any vaping products and that they need to lock everything away, which to some people might sound reasonable, but in practice, it doesn't work. So a couple of years ago, I was at a shop uh, up in Queensland called Aussie E6, run by Brett Gray. Uh, and when I was in there, they were clearing all of their floor of stock and putting it behind blacked out uh, panelling. Um, and originally, I thought they were just putting their vape juices and their vapes behind there because that's sort of the standard around the country. Uh, but they're also putting, you know, bottles of water, uh, pieces of cotton, even just even just like little tank protectors that are made of rubber. Uh, and I asked them why they did that. And apparently what had happened is the health department had gone into that shop recently and told them that anything within a vape shop was considered a tobacco product and therefore needed to be uh, hidden away from, from public view. Uh, so that means that health department inspectors are looking at rubber tank protectors and bottles of water uh, and saying, well, if it's in a vape shop, it's a tobacco product and therefore you must hide it. Meanwhile, you can go to a tobacconist and you can buy a pack of cigarettes, you can buy blocks of chocolate, fizzy drink, candy, uh, even just general supplies. And that's all out in the open and it's totally fine. So you see this sort of unfair treatment between vape shops and tobacconists that it's just ridiculous and needs to be changed. No, most of the industry is not owned or operated by any big tobacco companies. They're obviously uh, have divisions now and are getting into vapor products, but the vast majority of the industry uh, really has no connection to big tobacco. It wasn't started by big tobacco. It hasn't been built by big tobacco. Um, the industry and the community has sprung up um, organically from people wanting to quit smoking and find a healthier alternative. If the government over-regulates this uh, and, and puts through a prescription only model, you're gonna see job losses. So you're gonna see shops that employ three to four people and they're, they're you know small, and I mean small businesses, they're the backbone of of the Australian economy, about 70% of Australians are employed by small businesses. Uh, you're going to see thousands of job losses across the country. And these are people that are working class, that don't have a huge amount of savings, that have barely made it through all of the COVID restrictions and, and COVID lockdowns and all the economic turmoil as a result of that, uh, who are hoping that they can actually have a job and have a future. So the government needs to really consider that because otherwise you're looking at thousands of job losses, you're looking at an industry closing down and you're looking at people probably ending up on unemployment, unable to find new work, 
uh, and ending up ending up in a pretty awful cycle. Yeah, the community that's uh, grown around the industry is a big factor for a lot of people in being able to quit because there's so many different products out there and there's so many different uh, types of smokers and vapors out there. Finding the right product uh, is not um, always the first product you find or you try. So having a community around that can uh, give people advice on what worked for them, uh, what particular hardware, or what flavors, what nicotine strings, all the different elements of, uh, of the industry um, can, can be shared around by people within the community and that's helped a lot of people. Uh, certainly in Australia, because of the, uh, the nicotine restrictions, um, the community has been vital in people finding the products, um, but then also being able to share their knowledge about those products with each other and, and find access to them. So the community aspect is, is really a, 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 a second support network um, for people um, in their journey to, to quitting smoking. So it's been amazing to see the amount of people helping other smokers, whether it be at a, a local vape shop um, or in an online Facebook group, explaining how they quit and what they used to a new to a new vapor. So it's um it's really an integral part of the industry is that community aspect, sharing and and uh, exploring experiences. Look, a lot of vape vendors are, are pretty scared of what the the current regulatory framework is going to deliver for them. Uh, if the health minister pushes through his vaping importation ban and then he, and then manages to push through these TGA restrictions. Uh, the next step from there is then crackdowns on local vendors. And a lot of them are pretty worried about the longevity of their companies. I mean, these are people that started out five, six, seven years ago selling at market stalls and now have three, four, five or even more shops employing you know, thousands of people across the country. Uh, and in an economic downturn, where they've already had to deal with lockdowns and not being able to have customers for their shops and all that kind of stuff. Uh, they're facing absolute annihilation if, if the health minister gets his way on vaping. So, you know, a lot of them contact us pretty scared about what the next steps are. Uh, and it's our job to campaign for them and try and put up the biggest fight that we can to defeat the health minister and put in a proper regulatory framework. Um, he'd been smoking for 40 years, something like that. Um, didn't know anything about e-cigarette products or, or vape products um, and uh, yeah I was able to explain to him how it all worked and find a, a flavor that he liked um, help him uh, work out what nicotine level he should start at and um, yeah got him all set up and uh, when he came back I think a few weeks or a month later uh, and he hadn't smoked since he started and he was just so happy um, with how it was helping him get off of cigarettes and how effective it was I think it was a, a really nice moment when you found someone that uh, had previously tried to quit smoking and tried all the different techniques uh, and were able to get him onto something that, uh, that really helped him quit smoking. Um, regulation and uh, availability control uh, is really what needs to be done. I mean, vape vendors want a proper regulated market because they want to know where they stand. It gives them uh, the ability to plan long term because right now, a policy could change overnight and they've got to completely shift around their operations. Whereas if they know that they can stock nicotine liquids, they know what the regulatory framework looks like, they know what they can and can't do, it allows them to plan and build their businesses up and grow their businesses and set you know long-term planning goals. Whereas right now, vape vendors don't know what's going to happen today versus the next day. Uh, and that's just not the kind of marketplace you want to be working within. Yeah, the industry has been um, welcoming regulation uh, for years. They've wanted to work with governments, with uh, lawmakers, with uh, you know overseers of um, of the health side of things. We've wanted to sit down and, and have the industry regulated uh, appropriately. We absolutely are for um, not selling to under 18s or under 21s or whatever the legal smoking age is in a particular area. We're absolutely for um, sensible, responsible packaging um, and, and marketing. We're absolutely for regulated nicotine strengths um, and uh, ingredients and all that sort of thing. Like any uh, consumable, we are happy with sensible regulations. Uh, what the industry has been faced with though is massive pushback from the governments and not any sort of cooperation. In fact, quite the opposite. Um, a closed door and, and simply 
prohibition uh, measures taken. So there's really been no consultation um, with the industry. And if there has been, it's been um, largely uh, for show. And there's been no real acknowledgement of any of the recommendations that the industry has tried to make. Um, there's really been no cooperation at all from, from any governments um, in most countries, apart from New Zealand uh, and the United Kingdom. If it was all about the science, we wouldn't, there'd be no debate. There would be no debate. But there is a debate because it's not about the science. It is, a, it is an ideological warfare, um, and particularly in Australia. A trio of anti-smoking health nannies, led by Simon Chapman, provided a series of factual errors at a parliamentary inquiry into vaping and the use of e-cigarettes. Simon, Simon Chapman's claims were so inaccurate they prompted a response from Public Health England. That's correct. Part of the UK's Department of Health was so taken aback by Simon Chapman's false statements that they felt the need to go on the record and clear things up. The story even made it into the French media. During the parliamentary inquiry, Chapman and his group of health nannies made no less than seven false and misleading claims about vaping restrictions overseas and the results of legalisation in other countries. These inaccuracies had the potential to negatively affect the outcome of this important inquiry. It would appear as though Professor Chapman... I think e-cigarettes needs to be watched very, very carefully. He can be found soaking up hundreds of thousands of dollars in taxpayers' funds to conduct research that always seems tailored to suit his ideological agenda. Freedom, uh, Freeman and By Bloomberg Philanthropies and run through Bath University, I'm a very small part of it and it's about monitoring the tobacco industry on a global scale so we can keep more systematic tabs on how it is that they're undermining tobacco control. Swanson. E-cigarettes, they're becoming more popular in weekend markets. May have taken it upon themselves to purposely provide the public with false information to stop any changes to the government's policies on e-cigarettes. This would be an enormous tragedy because the evidence is that e-cigarettes save lives. Chapman, Freeman and Swanson continue to spread further misinformation on Twitter and other social media platforms while blocking anyone who disputes their false claims. Now Chapman is at the end of his career and his ability to do further damage to Australia's policy environment is limited. But I would like to highlight to my colleagues in the Senate that health nannies like Chapman are more than willing to attend inquiries and provide any information they can in order to suit their agenda. It does not matter to them if the information they provide is false or the research they point to is flawed because the ends justify the means. In this instance, the end goal is to continue the ban on safer nicotine alternatives and allow hundreds of thousands of people to suffer. Policymakers in this place should learn from Chapman's antics and remember that when you are looking to inform your policies with evidence, you should always look at the actual experience and credentials of those you call on to give evidence. Otherwise, you end up with ill-informed, willfully ignorant and downright malicious people like Chapman rocking up on the taxpayer's dollar to give you research that suits their particular agenda. Snake oil salesmen come in all shapes and sizes. Sometimes they take the guise of an emeritus professor of sociology. The, the nastiness and the vitriol um, that comes from certain elements of uh, vaping opponents is, is really quite odd. We're not having discussions about the, the science. There's all this criticism, there's this, this term bandied around that 95% less harmful to smoking is a factoid, whatever that word means. Um, and it's just, just to make it sound like, you know, I'm this snooty academic, you know, I've got 472 letters after my name, you know, I sip latte, um, aren't I wonderful? The vaping campaign in Australia is not evidence driven. It's driven by everything else but the evidence. It's very clear that, that vaping is reducing deaths and smoking related disease. So why would anyone oppose this? Yeah, and that's fine. You don't accept 95%. What is your number? Well, you don't get one. 
Um, and you then say, well, why are smoking rates falling in all these other countries and not here? Oh, well, let's talk about something else. It's all a big tobacco conspiracy. So there's this blinkered view that vaping is a big tobacco conspiracy. And once once you've sort of once you've stated that, then really we don't have to discuss the science. We don't have to discuss the international figures. We don't have to look at the evidence. Um, and anybody who disagrees with me is a big tobacco stooge. So it's a very it's a very simple and very lazy um, argument. But a lot of these people are ideological opponents of big tobacco. Now I'm no apologist for big tobacco. I, they've done a you know appalling job over the years. You know, it's, it's, it's you know one of these things where really it goes without saying. However, it's not about big tobacco. It's about smokers wanting to reduce their harm from smoking. Well, one of the main concerns is the long-standing abstinence-only approach to smoking that we've had in Australia. So there's this idea people should cease smoking, cease nicotine, stop anything that looks like a cigarette. It's kind of like the war on drugs. People should just stop. And um, we know that doesn't work, but there are people in public health who, who are stuck on and that. If you model. think about the situation in Australia, the whole reason for tobacco control is to get people off smoking. Now, here we have a mechanism which is one of the most popular forms of stop smoking in the world, has been shown over 17, 18 years. Again, as verified by the no less than the UK government to be at least 95% less harmful than smoking. If it was all about getting smokers off cigarettes, there would be no argument. There would be no argument. But the, the, these people have moved on from having a concern about smokers to really just basically their entire focus is big tobacco. And that's all they seem to think about. And that's, that's all they see. And they sort of jump at all these shadows and it's all a big tobacco conspiracy. And if smokers suffer, well, look, it's you know their fault for smoking anyway. We've told them not to, we've wagged our finger at them. We've spent lots of money um, you know, funding ourselves to tell everybody how clever we are and how you shouldn't smoke. Um, we've told them they don't know, well, tough for them. I mean, said, why, why are they doing this? And I do think it is a kind of uh, weird group think uh, that if a few people change their minds, the, the whole system would change its mind in Australia. But as it is, it's aligned, and I mean this, the Therapeutic Goods Association, Parliament, um, the, the government and the, uh, many of the officials are all lined up behind this idea. But actually, the real in-depth support of this idea is only you know, really by a few influential academics and public health activists. There's also political risk. So in some ways it's safer for um, governments to do nothing. Um, and there's huge political pressure from some of the health organisations to keep the status quo. So that, that's playing a role in, in, in government decisions. I mean, the, I, I, you know, so I, I have some sympathy for, for someone like Greg Hunt, amazingly. Uh, I, I, I sort of think, well, if you've got that kind of coalition uh, there, it looks very powerful. But actually, it's a very small number of uh, people. It's a very small number of kind of enforcers of the, the collective mindset on this that somehow have decided uh, to deprive Australians of much safer products than cigarettes, even though cigarettes are available just about everywhere. Uh, which to the rest of the world, uh, to, well, at least in Europe, uh, looks completely bizarre. Most smokers think that uh, the tobacco tax is an important part of the, uh, the battle against vaping in Australia. That's a widely held belief. Certainly there is a quit industry and, um, you know, there's a lot of government largesse thrown a lot of these organisations to run a whole lot of programs, which you know have been successful, but are probably, you know, they're not at their use by date, they're pretty close to it. So vaping is a disruption and any disruption threatens established industries. And the quit industry is an industry and a lot of people have based careers on it. Um, they've, you know, they've written papers, um, you know, the whole, uh, you know, raison d'etre is built around it. And yes, yeah, certainly vaping is a threat to that. So, you know, at some level, is it, um, you know, could that be part of the mix at a, at a subconscious level? Look, I, I wouldn't really express an opinion one way or the other, other than to say that idea has been floated. And, you know, you can sort of see that clearly a disruptive technology is a potential threat to people who have uh, who are invested in and benefit by um, you know existing models and technologies. Uh, you know many of the uh, tobacco control activists in terms of its use of science and and by that I mean the use of science is terrible. 
Uh, we see the same issues over and over and over again. I mean, I review the scientific output from the uh, you know, tobacco control community. It's genuinely dreadful. You see things like um, you know, correlations being assumed to be causation. You see all kinds of things to do with the, the gateway effect that are explainable by confounding. You see ridiculous misunderstandings of toxicology. Um, you know, the presence of a, uh, a you know, hazardous chemical does not mean it's toxic. It's the dose makes the poison. You see massive over-reliance on cell studies, uh, you know, in petri dishes. Uh, animal studies, which in many ways, you know, they're useful in some ways if you use them diagnostically, but they don't tell you much about the actual actual risk. Uh, and obviously with that, the government's continued push to make vaping products not accessible to people when we see the evidence um, that they do help people quit more effectively than any other form of quit aid. The, the key politicians um, have been kind of gripped by uh, essentially a, a, a relatively small group of quite sort of extremist people who are engaged in a, a sort of group thing, you know, you know, call them the public health establishment um, in Australia. They sort of see this issue very differently to how it's seen in, in, uh, in the UK and much of the rest of the world. Those people um, like me uh, and other tobacco harm reduction advocates are actually the enemy of big tobacco. But the tobacco control people get this round the wrong way and they claim with no justification whatsoever that we are the, the shields of big, big tobacco. In fact, they're the shields of big tobacco and it's a disgrace. I think the misinformation and the complete uh, lies that are being told are probably the most frustrating uh, when you see mainstream media um, pumping out studies that are false, uh, misleading and, and flawed. Uh, and also when studies that have been proven to be false, um, the impacts that those false reports have done are already there. So I think the misinformation and the lies um, around nicotine, around the effects of vaping, around the uh, use by children or youth, uh, all of it is is very uh, incorrect, a lot of the information that's being thrown around. So I think that's the most frustrating thing. I have uh, seen the US EPA and they have referred to um, a, an epidemic, an epidemic amongst youth in the United States of vaping. What has occurred, I think, is a public health disaster and uh, that is not something that on my watch I am willing to countenance. So no, that's not what I'm proposing on my time, on my watch, so long as I'm in this role. I'm sorry as an American that Australians have to deal with our youth vaping epidemic. And this Real world experience is extremely important. If you ask enough kids, have they experimented with something? They will say, yes, have you experimented with alcohol? Have you experimented with cigarettes, with vaping, with cannabis, with methamphetamine? You know, the lists go on and on and on. A lot of them will have, but that doesn't make them regular users. And it certainly doesn't mean that if they've used one, that leads them to the other. So this notion that vaping is a gateway to smoking is entirely discredited on the basis of real world experience in jurisdictions such as the UK for well over a decade, where youth smoking rates are falling. Now, if vaping was a gateway into smoking, rates of youth smoking in the UK, and I'll give that as the best example, would be rising, but they're not, they're falling. How do you know that all this anti-vaping publicity that you're pumping out, all these people freaking out on television, um, is not actually a driver itself of the problem that you're getting so worked up and having a moral panic about? How do you know that you, FDA, CDC, Campaign for Tobacco Free Kids, Bloomberg, are not part of the problem that you yourselves are railing against? Handing youth actors vape devices to vape on during ads, wouldn't that be counterintuitive? Michelle Minton from the USA recently did a study that clearly confirms the direct correlation between the amount of dollars spent on advertising on anti-vape campaigns and the increasing youth uptake of vaping. 
It's interesting because you thought that the USA would have learnt from the failed DARE experiment where they taught kids in schools about the harms of drugs and how to not use them. What they found is in fact it actually increased curiosity amongst the teens and they found that uptake or youth drug use actually increased. If only Dare had listened to its dad who told them this would happen. Who taught you how to do this? That's ridiculous. Sure, surely not. Surely we wouldn't go, our oh, kids shouldn't vape, so we're going to give you a vape, use it for the advert. That's illegal, right? Michelle makes this point uh, very well, I think. So, so we know that uh, CDC, when it did a survey of young people who vape, it found and it asked them what's the main reason uh, why you vape. The, 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 the most prevalent answer was because I'm curious about them. Now, what makes people curious? <laughs> you know, if you've got adult society losing its mind, and frankly, they have lost their mind about vaping in some parts of the US media and campaigning organizations, FDA, CDC, and you're seeing you're seeing adults, uh, you know, going crazy on television and you know, telling you how you know this is the worst thing ever. Surely that is an invitation to be curious about it. Um, and you know, if you're if, if if your job as a teenager is to do what adult society doesn't want you to do, uh, you know, and for some kids that's what it will be then everybody disapproving and, you know, behaving like Old Testament prophets when it comes to talking about this stuff is a fairly clear signal to you to go out and find out what it's all about. And some of, some of the advertising is so ridiculous and so absurd, you know, worms growing in your face. It's almost, it's almost comical. Um, and I, I think if you're a, a, a normal teen, you would, you would almost want to sort of disrespect how patronizing some of this adult attitudes and advertising is to you. And, you know, basically uh, raise, a, raise a finger to adult, you know, adult authority that's trying to stop you doing this. Look, I think the youth anti-vaping campaigns in the US have been a big mistake. I mean, the message from these campaigns is that vaping's cool and all your friends are doing it. So naturally what kids are gonna do is try that especially if they're told not to. I mean, we, we know how kids think, and it seems in the US they got that wrong. The number one reason why kids try vaping is curiosity. And the more these campaigns raise awareness and increase interest, the more kids are likely to try them. I think we need to frame vaping as an adult quit smoking aid. It's not something for young people. It's not something for, for non-smokers. It's an adult tool to quit smoking. And I think we can eliminate or minimise uh, exposure to young people by uh, strict laws on age of sale and enforcement of those and, and avoiding any promotion to young people. Uh, so the fact that you can do surveys and ask teenagers, have they vaped or have they smoked or have they uh, you know, used alcohol and a certain percentage of them obviously will say yes. Uh, making it illegal doesn't stop them doing it. Um, but that doesn't mean that one has led to the other. So to assume that because a teenager may have vaped and may have smoked means that the vaping leads them to smoking is entirely, uh, entirely wrong. When one examines what has happened over with thousands, if not tens of thousands of people in multiple jurisdictions over a decade. Current rates of vaping among teens in Australia, 14 to 17 years old, is a 1.8%. And that is for occasional, at least once a month use. 90% have never, ever tried vaping. Meanwhile, smoking rates for teens aged 14 to 17 have remained stagnant over the last three years at around about 3.2%. We've actually done pretty well in minimising the uh, teenage smoking. Um, could fall further, but it's fallen a lot and it's at fairly low levels already. 
research has shown very little youth uptake um, vapor products in the United Kingdom. So the evidence is just not there to suggest that vaping is a gateway to smoking. Uh, kids aren't starting to use vapor products and then start smoking. Um, if anything, vapor products are something that they would use as an alternative to smoking. But even that, the evidence suggests that there is uh, very minor youth uptake. Uh, really, vaping products are used by smokers to reduce their uh, harm. Now, the argument that is made is that um, there are uh, risks for uh, young people who have never smoked before uh, and start vaping and then start smoking the so-called gateway hypothesis. And there are risks to older populations because we don't know how uh, risky vaping is in the long term. Now, this is just nonsense. Firstly, study after study after study shows that very, very few people who have never smoked cigarettes before start vaping. And if they do start vaping, almost inevitably, um, they just experiment with vaping infrequently for a short period and then give it up. They often don't even use nicotine when they vape. Yes, in the US uh, recently, they did have an outbreak of lung disease in people who vaped. Uh, we now know that that had nothing to do with nicotine vaping as we use in Australia. What that was due to was uh, black market, illegal THC or cannabis oils that were used in vaping products. And these were contaminated with vitamin C acetate uh, which is not available in uh, commercial vaping products for, for nicotine. So they have nothing to do with what we're talking about, which is nicotine vaping to help people quit smoking. So there's no evidence of serious lung harm from nicotine vaping, and it's far safer to the lungs than smoking. Importing liquid for e-cigarettes will effectively spell the end of vaping in Australia. The federal government is banning the products on health grounds, but advocates say it will push people back to traditional cigarettes. Vaping in Australia set to go up in smoke. It's illogical, it's illiberal, and it's going to condemn thousands of smokers to premature death. On July 1st, new federal regulations will see the import of e-cigarettes containing vaporiser nicotine and refills banned from entering the country. Buying online will be illegal and those that flout the rules could cop a $220,000 fine. One of the reasons that Greg Hunt wants to introduce these strict regulations is to reduce poison. Uh, he stated that from 2018 to 2019, poisonings had doubled in Victoria. Well, we did a Freedom of Information request and found that, in fact, over that period, poisonings had actually stayed the same. So there had been an increase, a 40% increase in the number of calls, but the number of people actually treated or referred to treatment stayed unchanged. So that's in spite of an increase in vaping, and the numbers were very small. So I, I think concerns about poisoning uh, of children uh, are, are over overplayed and i don't think that's a, a priority that should influence our um, regulations so why should the uh, ACCC regulate cigarettes in australia but the therapeutic goods administration regulate uh, vaping and heated tobacco products doesn't make any sense to me if you go one step back further uh, we've found that at the moment, and this is about to change, but at the moment, um, nicotine for vaping is included in the poison standard in Schedule 7, but nicotine in cigarettes is exempt from the poison standard. Now, so the, the form of nicotine that uh, so far hasn't killed anybody anywhere around the world um, is in the poison standard, but the form of nicotine that kills 21,000 Australians every year is exempt from the poison standard. That doesn't make sense to me. So 
Uh, look, there's an old adage that says things are dangerous, ban all things. Um, look, there have been some poisonings. That is really a function of two, of two issues. Number one, yes, nicotine liquid should be kept away from children. So should washing detergent, so should bleach, um, so should pesticides, um, so, should, so should insecticides, so should coolant, you know, if you've got it in your garage for your car, I mean, the list of products that should, and so should a whole lot of prescription medicines. There are 2,000 um, deaths uh, almost each year in Australia from prescription medicine overdoses, and some of those also affect children. So absolutely, absolutely nicotine liquid should be kept away from children but we don't ban laundry products we don't ban garden products um, we say they should be in proper you know childproof containers and kept away from children legalization means that there can be regulation and people can get nicotine liquid in uh, containers that have childproof locks it's very simple if it is illegal and people are buying products on the black market then yeah Obviously, the safety uh, concerns are less. When, when I first heard of uh, the nicotine, essentially a ban on importing nicotine from Greg Hunt, I, uh, I panicked. I didn't have very much left in my freezer and I was thinking to panic buy. Uh, but then again, at the same time, with postage times as they are and with the level of fines, I think it was $220,000 for importing nicotine illegally without a prescription or even, they weren't even clear about uh, how that whole thing would work. I panicked, I absolutely panicked. It is far more a case uh, of being a ramp on rather than a pathway off smoking. Every and, three uh, years, the Australian Institute of Health and Welfare conducts a national drug household survey. The latest results showed the good news that 127,000 fewer Australians are smoking than three years, pr th three years prior. That almost exactly matches the 130,000 extra Australians that are now using uh, less harmful e-cigarettes on a daily basis. Now, not everyone that has given up smoking has reverted to an e-cigarette, but almost, according to this data, almost 90% of those that use e-cigarettes daily have previously been smokers. The statistical evidence now clearly shows that e-cigarettes can help cut smoking rates, which is why every developed country in the world, except for us, except for Australia and Turkey, has legalised their use. Why do we hold out? The most common reason given is that vaping could be an on-ramp, encouraging some people to take up smoking. Again, the data does not back this up. Just 1% of current smokers tried an e-cigarette before they tried a real cigarette. This is based on that Australian Institute of Health and Welfare study, uh, a, a very extensive survey, and just 1% of those who currently smoke actually tried an e-cigarette before they tried a real cigarette. So it's not a round ramp. It's clearly not an on-ramp. In the Australian government's own evidence, it's not an on-ramp. E-cigarettes are a gateway to get off smokes, not to get hooked on them. When you look at the AIHW data, uh, it backs up what we've been saying. So youth vaping rates at best are exp experimental only, uh, and they're from people who otherwise would have smoked. Uh, but the actual on-ramp theory that gets pushed by anti-vapers just doesn't exist. People aren't going from vaping to smoking because when you think about it logically, it doesn't make sense. No one is going to go from a product that costs them probably 10 to 15 bucks a week that they can get in a myriad of flavors that doesn't kill two or three long-term users. They're not gonna then make the jump to a product that costs 40 to $50 a pack and kills them and tastes like a fucking bushfire. It's, it just, it doesn't work out and the data backs that up. So when in late June, the Minister for Health this year uh, announced that there would be a ban on the importation of vaping liquids, some of my friends contacted me, concerned that that would lead them back to vapes. I agreed that there was a concern and it did seem heavy handed. So I started a petition with Mr George Christensen, the member for Dawson, to try to overturn the ban. Little did we realise the reaction that that would generate. I was gobsmacked with the response. In three days, uh, we had more than 70,000 people sign the petition. In the end, myself and uh, 27 other members of the Liberal National Party room wrote to the uh, Minister for Health asking him to reconsider. Christensen and Matt Canavan put together a petition. Uh, originally, I think they were hoping to get a couple of thousand signatures on that. Uh, and our group and AFRA and a whole bunch of vendors around the country uh, you know, really worked together to make sure we could get as many numbers on that petition as possible. And I think in about just over 48 hours, we got about 70,000 signatures, which was huge. Uh, the effect of that was then it then triggered uh, 
uh, other backbench MPs to start getting marked up about this issue and, and pushing back against the health minister. And it even took the attention of the opposition. So afterwards, you saw Bill Shorten, the former uh, uh, former Labor leader, uh, you know, out there basically saying that he also supported vaping legalisation. So a lot of the times we'll see people say, oh, well, is there any point in signing a petition or sending an email to an MP? You know, politicians don't listen. Well, this is a perfect example of how they do listen. Uh, what I'm finding is that for a lot of people, it's been a, uh, a gateway not into smoking, but a gateway out of smoking. And that uh, a lot of people say that e-cigarettes and the vaping is a way of them weaning themselves off, which is more effective than nicotine patches. The government, without any warning, said 1 July, you can't bring in any e-cigarettes or, or nicotine products for this from overseas. The dilemma with that is that all of a sudden, you're just going to either force people to illegal uh, tobacco or indeed smoking. I think the government needs to give longer than six months to get it right. Can you get them quiet? I'm, I'm struggling. A controversial ban on personal vaping products has been suspended for six months following a backbench revolt. Opponents argue outlawing the importation of liquid nicotine used in e-cigarettes would push users back to smoking. The health minister now says the ban will apply from January 1st with a streamlined process for patients to get a GP prescription. So you see it at a federal level, you had in that letter that was sent to the health minister, 28 backbench MPs. Uh, we know that there were more that silently were uh, quite critical of the health minister's plans. The real targets for people who are affected by this are the representative politicians, democratically elected politicians. And they are interesting be because they deal with these issues in a more intuitive, instinctive way. And you can see this in the politicians uh, in, the, in the parliament in Australia who understand this instinctively. They, you know, they're not, they're not, you know, they're not scientists, they're not intended to be scientists. They don't have to be scientists to see through the issues clearly on this. Nick Hunt is now struggling as he finds 28 backbenchers against him on this topic. He now has decided to hand over this issue to the Therapeutic Goods Administration. A new plan by the federal government will see e-cigarettes made available in Australia, but only from pharmacies and with a prescription. But vaping advocates say that could create a black market and push people back into using traditional cigarettes. Uh, for example, some of the solvents in them, one of them is antifreeze, which is used and then vaporised and people inhale it. As seen there, John Scarrett, who heads up the Therapeutic Goods Administration, referred to propylene glycol as antifreeze. He not only signed off the approval of the use of propylene glycol in several products over the years, but it's also still commonly used in therapeutic uses, even in products that are reimbursed by the Pharmaceutical Benefits Scheme. So can we trust the TGA to govern the use of these products if they really don't have the knowledge? Even if they are 95% less harmful than cigarettes, it's still less harmful. Uh, if I cross the local freeway, it's probably less harmful if I'm hit by a car than hit by a truck, but is either desirable? The TGA is our medicines regulator, so they regulate medicines. They regulate products as medicines, which involves doctors and pharmacists and very high standards of, of regulation. But nicotine liquid is not a medicine. It's a consumer product designed to replace other uh, more deadly consumer products. So it really should be regulated as a consumer product by the Australian Competition and Consumer Commission. Um, and, and until it's regulated by them, it will have these ridiculously high standards required, uh, which are applied to medicines. Well, there are two changes coming up in the next few months. One is the TGA amendment to uh, the classification of nicotine. The other is the customs regulations. Um, and the outcome of these two changes is to make importing nicotine by vapors illegal with a penalty of $220,000. So people can't bring in their own nicotine, um, but it will be legal to get nicotine uh, from a doctor if the doctor's willing to prescribe it 
and then through a pharmacy if the pharmacy is willing to dispense it. Um, the, the outcome of all this will mean it's obviously much harder for people to access nicotine. The costs will clearly increase. Uh, there'll be no regulation of products, uh, unfortunately, as there is now. Um, and um, it'll be very hard for vape shops to remain profitable because vaping products will be moving into pharmacy. Yeah, under the new streamlined guidelines, it will be a simple process for GPs to write a prescription. So it will be available at the first visit. Uh, and the script is valid for 12 months. If you don't have that, if you have a pharmacist who doesn't understand the industry, doesn't understand the products that they're selling, doesn't understand the, uh, the nicotine levels and the flavors that are available, you're gonna find less people um, are firstly gonna be exposed to the products and therefore have an, app, uh, an opportunity to quit, but they're also not gonna be as effective um, as a quitting aid when they're not being dispensed or retailed by knowledgeable, uh, experienced vapors. Yeah, look, it's not ethical to put up barriers to accessing a less harmful alternative. I mean, it's a basic human right that people should have access to the best possible health. And by adding up, adding barriers to accessing nicotine, we're, we're actually making it harder to, for people to achieve uh, good health. And, and governments should be encouraging good health and the best possible help by supporting these decisions and, and actually facilitating them. Yeah, there are many components to a vapor product that uh, will determine whether it's liked by someone or effective. Um, obviously the, the hardware and the device, but also the liquid the flavor and the nicotine strength that's in there. And if the government tries to move to a pharmaceutical based prescription system, um, we know that they're not going to be able to offer people the same flavors and the same nicotine strengths that they've traditionally had available. And again, that's going to mean a less effective product for people to quit with. And the government should be doing everything they can to provide products that are going to be as effective as possible um, and safe. And the pharmaceutical prescription system just isn't necessary. It's not being used in the United Kingdom. It's not being used in New Zealand. It's not even being used in the US. It's going to mean subpar products and more importantly, uh, a really restricted access. It's gonna mean less people are able to get these products. And again, the effectiveness is diminished. So there's no need for a pharmaceutical system. There's no need for a prescription system. Uh, it's only gonna do more harm than good. Well, the TGA has streamlined the process so that a doctor will need to apply once to the TGA for permission to write nicotine prescriptions. And after that can then write a simple prescription for each patient without getting approval on each occasion. The problem will be finding a doctor who is familiar with vaping, uh, understands nicotine and is willing mm. to write nicotine prescriptions. So here what they're trying to do is introduce a de facto prohibition whilst having a respectable narrative so the minister can stand up in parliament and say, well, you know, they can get it through a, a, a physician uh, if the need is there and through a pharmacy if they're, if they're supplying it. The fact that the physicians won't do it and the pharmacists won't supply it, that's just tough. You know, so I look at that, it's just sickeningly disingenuous. It should be called out. It's a de facto prohibition, if not a de jure prohibition. That's what they're trying to do. That's what the policy intent is. Well, if your GP uh, bog wills and is willing to write a nicotine prescription, you will be able to have your uh, consultation bulk billed. But if you need to seek help elsewhere, uh, using telehealth uh, in particular, uh, you won't be able to get a bulk billed service because they're not available, uh, that's telehealth services, it, it, through other GPs other than your own GP. So I'll go and get a, get a prescription, which you don't need for cigarettes or we've spoken before, these other nicotine containing uh, products. The Australian Medical Association and quite a few other health and medical organisations have been uh, violently opposed to vaping. And, and I think a lot of that misinformation and anti-vaping feeling will stick with doctors for some time. I think doctors will come around over time as the evidence becomes clearer, but uh, it will take some time. And I think the problem is going to be finding GPs and other doctors who are willing to uh, take 
the harm reduction view and support that view. Where I think Australia differs, however, is they've taken this platform of really shoddy science, you know, poor methods, poor interpretation, you know, usually baseless conclusions, and they've turned it into an aggressive, the foundations for a very aggressive, restrictive policy response, which is, you know, if you look at what they're trying to do in Australia, they're trying to basically ban vaping in all but name, you know, closing off every possible option to somebody accessing, somebody who's a smoker, accessing a product that is 20, maybe 100 times less risky. I mean, it's bizarre, it's insane, but that's what they're doing. Look, the Pharmacy Guild is opposed to vaping, but it will be legal for pharmacies to dispense nicotine, so some will. Um, and there will also be online pharmacies who will provide nicotine uh, on an online basis. So there will be some services, we don't know how many yet, but certainly um, a lot of pharmacies won't be providing nicotine, at least initially. And then written into the face of the legislation, you have a pass for tobacco, for nicotine products that are tobacco prepared and packed for smoking. It's, it couldn't be more absurd to, to do it that way. And yet what they're doing is trying to pile in a, a load of science behind that to justify which to any in any common sense view is ridiculous. Well, this model doesn't include international vendors. So smokers and vapors can't order nicotine online from overseas. They can only access it through Australian pharmacies. Um, they can access it through online Australian pharmacies uh, who then dispense it, but uh, no, these prescriptions aren't valid for overseas uh, purchases. Look, if I had the chance to meet John Skerritt, who heads up the TGA, I'd ask him one simple question, which is why does he think, as an unelected, faceless bureaucrat that no one can have any sway over, why does he think that he can push a regulatory model that not a single country around the world is implementing? Not a single country is trying to go with a prescription-only model on vaping. Yet this guy, who no one can vote for and no one can turf out, thinks that he can push this. It's ridiculous. Pull your head out of your ass. Stop putting government tax and government profits before public health, because that's what clearly you've been doing. Sit down with the industry, look at the facts, and let's regulate this thing in a way that allows people to have access to these products, yet still keep them. Uh, safe and away from children. It's not hard to do. We have plans and ideas uh, of the way this industry can be regulated. And the government is basically just putting its head in the sand and, and doing its own thing. We want to sit down and, and work this out. Uh, so a question I've been getting asked recently by people in the media and even some MPs is, well, what's wrong with the prescription model? To which my response is, you don't need a prescription to get cigarettes. You shouldn't need a prescription to access a product that doesn't kill you like cigarettes do. Uh, the idea that a vapor who has, for the most part, has tried multiple ways to quit smoking. They've tried patches, they've tried gum, they've tried Champix. Some of them have tried hypnotherapy. The uh, go through a consult that's paid for by the taxpayer, then get a prescription. Only if the doctor will actually make that prescription. Most doctors are saying that they won't. Uh, then they have to go to a pharmacy to buy vaping liquids, of which the pharmacy guild say that they don't want to stock these products. So which pharmacy are they going to get to? Uh, and then maybe if they've gone through all of those loopholes, they may be able to access a product that isn't the same as what they used to consume. Uh, it's just ludicrous. It's not going to work and it's going to drive vapors back to smoking. So it's an unworkable model pushed by a health minister who has categorically said for years that he opposes vaping. Uh, and it's a way for him to turn around to his colleagues and say, oh, I'm providing an avenue for legal vaping. Uh, and unfortunately, a lot of MPs, even if they're broadly supportive of the idea, they're not quite across the detail of how policies will affect consumers. Uh, and I think he's hoping that they'll support that. You know, it's our job to educate them as to why it's unworkable and go from there. Deaths. It simply means more deaths. More people are going to continue to smoke less people are going to find vapor products uh, and that's going to result in more death you're going to have more people smoking we know what smoking does it's going to kill more people so it's simply going to reduce the amount of people 
using vapor products to quit smoking and therefore result in more sickness and death from smoking. Australia's approach is a de facto prohibition. The, the effects will be people will return to cigarettes, probably illicit cigarettes. Uh, I, like most vapors out there, would really struggle with uh, the addiction of nicotine and, and smoking, uh, and most likely I would go back to smoking traditional cigarettes. If vaping were made illegal, the hubris within me says there's no way I'd go back to smoking. No, no chance in hell I would not go back to smoking. But if I look at my history and if I'm honest with myself, which many people are not, uh, I have to say I, pro I probably would go back to smoking. There will absolutely be a black market um, spring up if, uh, if this legislation goes through. It will uh, mean that uh, more professional criminals will enter the market. Uh, there will be internet sales uh, and attempts to get around a ban, uh, which the main effect will, of that will be to prevent uh, any Indigenous Australian vaping market uh, or va vaping supply developing, and so on. Um, so there is nothing good about a prohibition, particularly when you're prohibiting something that is a much safer alternative to the dominant market incumbent, i.e. cigarettes. It's devastating to think about people uh, going back to traditional combustible cigarettes when they've made that switch already, when they've already uh, got off of the, uh, the poisonous analogues and found something to replace that that's not nearly as harmful. Um, it's devastating to hear about people going back to something that's most likely going to kill them. And this is the essential insanity of the Australian approach. You're banning, you know, in practice, the, the much safer alternative and leaving the much more dangerous alternative available on the market, either through highly taxed legal supply or increasingly through illicit supply. It could not be more bonkers. The government and the Therapeutic Goods Administration announced on the 23rd of September this year, 2020, um, there's no proposal to introduce regulation of nicotine for vaping. One of the largest, if not the largest, survey of Australian vapors uh, ever conducted. Uh, and unfortunately, a lot of the findings are pretty damning. So close to half of all of those surveyed said that if a prescription model was put forward, they would go straight back to cigarettes. So if you extrapolate that out, that's about a quarter of a million Australians going back to cigarettes. In addition, about 40% of those surveyed said that if a prescription model was put forward, that they would just access these products on the black market. Uh, and this is the thing that policymakers don't understand. It's that in the age of the internet and VPNs, you can buy almost anything you want online and import it in, and it's probably going to get past border force. So the regulatory model that the health minister is putting forward is going to force people to buy products that they don't necessarily have quality controls on or consumer protection on, import them in illegally, risk fines or even imprisonment, uh, all because he doesn't like a product that's helping them get away from cigarettes. And what the government's been proposing, which would start on the 1st of January 2021, would do the opposite. It would make it very inconvenient, very difficult, to get hold of vaping in Australia uh, would increase the price of vaping compared to what it was previously. Um, and it's just an unworkable proposition. Uh, so a prescription model for, for vape vendors and producers means complete annihilation. Uh, what it looks like is essentially, if you wanna have a product that's prescription only, you have to get it approved by the TGA. Now, to go through the TGA, you're going to have to make separate applications for separate flavours and separate nicotine concentrations that could cost tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of dollars per product. Your local vape shop's not going to be able to afford to go through that process. The only companies that will will be big tobacco firms that are multinational and have billions of dollars or big pharmaceutical firms that are multinational and have billions of dollars. Uh, so the end result is you're probably going to be looking at limited flavours uh, within a limited range at pharmacies sold by people who don't know anything about vaping. They don't know the difference between direct to lung vapes or mouth to lung vapes. They wouldn't know the difference between, you know, a, a, a sub ohm mod or even just a new pod system. Uh, and they're not going to be able to help you along your way towards quitting smoking. So if you care about the local vendors and if you care about supporting the vaping industry and supporting the people that have helped you quit, 
uh, you must do everything you can to fight against a prescription model. Nicotine-based e-cigarettes will soon be available with a prescription for the very first time. The interim decision has been made by the Therapeutic Goods Administration. Are using these vaping machines, yeah. whatever you call them, these vaping things. Um, this is a worry. I mean, this is still nicotine. You know, do these kids think they're not Absolutely. smoking, but they, they're still ingesting nicotine? This constant push in the media that vaping is worse than smoking uh, really hits home to people, who, even who have vaped. Uh, and this misinformation, it just, it just outrages me because I, I know this, this particular person who quit vaping because of the nickel coils and then started smoking again. If you can go and buy cigarettes, then you should be able to buy nicotine e-cigarettes. The media is a really big problem when it comes to vaping and the perception of it. Australian National University reviewed worldwide evidence on smoking behaviour. It found that non-smokers who used e-cigarettes were three times more likely to take up conventional smoking compared to people who didn't use vaping devices. The report was commissioned by a health minister who has stated that vaping will not be legalised on his watch. And I think there is an old adage that says that he who pays the piper calls the tune. I'm not pointing the finger at any individual, but if you set up an inquiry in a particular way, and this is standard stuff from Yes Ministers, Humphrey Appleby would always say, well, you don't set up an inquiry unless you know in advance what the results are going to be. So you set up an inquiry to get you the answer that you want. And, uh, you know, the minister set up an inquiry and he got the answer that he wanted. The studies have shown that young people who try vaping are more likely to try other risky behaviours like drinking alcohol, smoking cannabis, using other drugs. That doesn't mean that vaping cause people to become smokers, and probably most of them would have become smokers anyway. Um, youth vaping is generally experimental, it's generally short term, and most youth, youth vaping is by young people who already smoke. But the bottom line is that we don't think trying vaping makes you more likely to try smoking. It's just that you are at risk uh, to do that anyway. What I think is fascinating, what I think is fascinating is the spin. Um, in particular, I noticed it's, it, it's crowed about how a majority of Indigenous Australians don't smoke. 40.2%, according to their own inquiry, 40.2% of Indigenous citizens smoke. That is three times the average of the population. And somehow they're patting themselves on the back that it's not over 50%. I think that almost by itself tells you about the quality um, or lack thereof of, uh, of this particular study. Look, I, I think the statement that vaping leads to relapse is very misleading. So what, what they this particular study is, is, not, is ignoring is the fact that smokers who switch to vaping are generally more addicted, they've tried lots of times to quit, and they have greater trouble quitting. So they are more likely to relapse because of that, not because they're vaping. But other research shows that they're actually less likely to, to relapse. And we know from vapors that vaping plays an important role in preventing them from relapse because it gives them the nicotine they're addicted to and it gives them a hand-to-mouth behavior. So it helps them to deal with urges uh, to smoke. So I, I don't think it's a fair statement that uh, vaping increases relapse. I think it's quite the opposite. If vaping was causing people to take up smoking, then the rates of smoking in countries where vaping is not only supported, in the UK it's promoted. It's actually promoted. They put signs on bus stops telling people to switch to vaping. So if this was causing people to take up smoking, you'd think, number one, the government would probably stop it. So if ANU is, is suggesting, and I'm not saying that they are, but you know, if they were suggesting that the UK government and the, the NZ government are somehow big tobacco stooges, because apparently you know, everybody who supports vaping is according to, uh, to certain elements, um, then you would expect an increase in smoking rates. And there isn't, there is a decline in smoking rates. So this notion that if people are vaped, they're three times as likely to take up smoking, um, really only um, some sort of academic sitting in an ivory tower could come up with that. So concerns about long-term use of nicotine are really unfounded. I mean, this is the whole point of tobacco harm reduction. Um, continuing to vape nicotine prevents people from going back to smoking and all the harmful chemicals that go with it. Um, and the health effects, effects of vaping nicotine are minimal compared to relapse to smoking. So I don't think we should be at all concerned about people continuing to use nicotine if they need to, 
to prevent with the smoking. A cancer charity or a public health association or a medical association, you're a professional in this business. You really should know about this and you should be making professionally grounded um, uh, in, have professionally grounded insights into this. And therefore, because these are obvious problems and there is enough evidence to tell you to be worried about them, the date of guilty knowledge is in the past. You should know, and if you don't know, you're negligent. So what Matt Canavan and Holly Hughes have done is put up another um, Senate inquiry, but this time, this time, the aim is to look to legalise vaping and essentially adopt a model which would be similar to that which is now in New Zealand. So we don't have to reinvent wheels. Um, it's not like we're being the first to go down this path. Um, so hopefully uh, this, uh, this Senate inquiry will come up with a much more workable and useful solution. Look, I think the Senate inquiry is critical. We're at a point where if left uncontrolled, the TGA and, and Greek Hub could really uh, undermine vaping in Australia. I think if the committee comes down in favour of vaping, uh, Greg Hunt will have to consider his position. He's already outnumbered in his own party. And I think at the end of the day, this is all political. If he's uh, outnumbered and the committee comes uh, in with a view opposed to his, he's going to have to re have a really close look at things and it will put him under a lot of political pressure. So yes, I think this Senate inquiry is very important. Um, I'm quite certain that opponents of, of vaping will uh, will certainly do their all to uh, to try and derail it. Uh, I'd be sort of stunned if they don't. Um, but it does have a degree of political support from you know tremendous people like Matt Canavan, Holly Hughes, and there are others. And I should say um, across the political divide, it's not just on the government side. There are also, um, as I'm aware, people in the opposition. They won't say this publicly. Um, but there is support in the opposition benches and on the cross benches too for, uh, for legalisation of vaping. Yeah, look, we have had parliamentary inquiries in the past, but things are changing. We've got a lot more evidence now. There's over half a million vapors and voters in Australia uh, and the momentum's building. Um, and sooner or later, we have to accept that vaping is one of the biggest public health breakthroughs for a long time. Uh, and I think this Senate inquiry could be an important uh, turning point to uh, move us in that direction. What does that actually mean for vapors? So that means that they can make submissions to this inquiry uh, around vaping uh, and why vaping is helping quit, and why it's beneficial and why it should be legalised. So this inquiry will look at all of the evidence. That Reports to the uh, Senate inquiry from local and international experts are important, but the committee has specifically said it wants to hear from vapors uh, uh, to understand vaping and how it's worked for them. This has never happened before, uh, and they're clearly very concerned about the, the, the man on the ground who is, has struggled to quit and has now been successful with vaping. Uh, so the most important thing a vapor can do is to write one or two pages to tell the committee their story and how vaping has helped them and why they feel it shouldn't be changed uh, and it should be kept available for Australian, Australian smokers. It's probably our best chance to have the Senate look at something independently from the Health Minister, review the evidence, go through the documents and see what's actually happening and hear from people that are affected. Uh, and, and you know make a determination from there and the benefit of having this inquiry is it forces the government to actually look at the evidence and we know that the evidence is on our side. People are angry, people are frustrated uh, and they're also scared that they're not going to have access to nicotine uh, and that is going to send them back to smoking. Many people die from smoking in Australia every year. 20,000 people every year in Australia die of smoking. It makes COVID-19 like look like a droopy-eyed armless child. People are pissed off. People are pissed off. Uh, they're sick of uh, having to fight the government to have access to basic human rights. What do you mean only fresh air is safe to breathe? Been to my town lately? What do you mean vaping is a gateway to smoking? Smoking numbers are down. What do you mean nicotine is a deadly chemical? Heard of lemon flavored bleach? Huh?
I think people are angry because the government is trying to make a decision on something they don't know anything about um, without any real uh, motivation to actually help the public. This battle can absolutely be fought at a state level. Uh, that's what's happening in New South Wales. So Michael Johnson's pushing his petition to legalise vaping here. And how it works without trying to bore viewers is essentially the TGA, which is a federally funded body, uh, they have oversight on how they schedule certain products such as nicotine. So they can schedule product like nicotine as a schedule seven poison. Uh, and then the states sort of follow that lead, but it's up to the states how they enforce that legislation. So states can create special rules and they can say, okay, yes, liquid nicotine is a poison unless it's prepared in a such a way uh, for vaping with these safety standards in place, in which case it's a consumer product. So it's up to the states how they enforce it. And there is interest from other states uh, and it, it's theoretically possible that individual states may move forward on their own. I'm Michael Johnson. I'm the Nationals member for the Upper Hunter in the New South Wales Parliament. I'm running a petition at the moment to legalise vaping in New South Wales. I'd love you to go in there and sign my petition and it's at vapethestate.com.au. I know it's important that we legalise vaping and why do I know this? Because I was a smoker and now I'm a vapor, and I need your help to tell the rest of the world, let's get this done. Most people will know somebody who smokes or they may know a family member who, who smoked. They may know of somebody who's suffered smoking related illness. And so therefore, given that is, and I think it's a really important point, it is no, you know, to use the, the cliche, it's no skin off anybody else's nose to enable those people who can't quit smoking to use the at least 95% less harmful option. It's not costing, you know, like you say, the, the, the otherwise uninterested bystander um, is not in any way disadvantaged by this. In fact, they can be advantaged um, if, you know, they need to go to hospital and there's less um, smoking related diseases that uh, people, you know, taking up the bed. So it's to their, if anything, it's to their advantage. We all want to live in a community where people have longer lives and healthier lives. I've met thousands of vapors since starting this campaign. I've, I've lost count. In our own subscriber base, we have about 60,000 subscribers. Uh, every single vapor I talk to says that vaping has helped them lead, lead a better lifestyle. Now, it may be health wise, it may be because they feel better, they can run around with their kids in the backyard now, uh, or it might even just be financially. Uh, most smokers are working class people, they don't have a huge amount of disposable income. So when they switch to vaping and save, you know, five, six, seven, eight, nine thousand dollars a year, that's massive for them. So when people say, you know, vaping saved my life, they don't necessarily mean health-wise, they mean it saved their quality of life uh, and it should be applauded. And if we want to get people to make that shift from the high risk option to the low risk option, we've got to make sure that the low risk option is more convenient to obtain, is more attractive, uh, is more effective, is safer. Um, in every way, it's superior to the high risk option. And that means we've got to have lots of flavours, uh, all the things that are important to people who vape. Um, there's just right and wrong. There's, there's an old saying, not many people have heard, but uh, when times are good, it's easy to do the right thing. But when times are tough, that's when you find out who the actual heroes are. And uh, times are tough for vapors in Australia right now. Times are tough for smokers in Australia right now. The, the tax on cigarettes has gone up again in the middle of a pandemic, when stress goes up, when smoking numbers go up, we're, we're trying to protect, we're, we're, we're bending over backwards to protect, protect people from a virus that is not going to kill as many people as smoking is going to kill. Theologically, uh, I support it. It's a bad, the current regulations are a bad regulation uh, and they need to be overturned. Uh, and then financially, I support it as well because we can create jobs, we can build an industry, we can employ Australians and we can benefit our economy. Uh, and in addition, we can reduce smoking related deaths. I mean, I, I can't think of another campaign issue that has so many policy wins that go across so many different issues. So it benefits health, it benefits jobs, it benefits the economy, it benefits uh, society. Uh, and it actually long-term hurts tobacco companies.
I, the, the idea that a health minister would be opposed to this just boggles my mind, yet here we so are. So since uh, vaping really started to get popular uh, yes. around about 2016 and 17, we're seeing the share price of tobacco companies halve over the next three or four years. And the reason for that is their cigarette scales are stalling or dropping and the investors can see that this is an industry that is not going to last. It's going to be replaced by the, nic the new nicotine industries, vaping, um, heated tobacco products, snus, uh, tobacco pouches. They are going to replace the standard traditional combustible cigarette. Good thing too. I'm not advocating for civil disobedience. And I'm not telling smokers to put their packs above their heads, go down and pick at the joint. But it's time we had a more open approach to data and evidence. And it's time we had a trial like this because I don't want to relive the five years where we fought against medical cannabis only to have this eureka moment and now discover we shouldn't have taken this attitude that the evidence is not complete. Well, you know what? The evidence will never be complete as long as we ban something that is already broadly available. We should be more open to work with our supermarkets, with our points of sale and through education and the public health groups to make sure that vaping is possible in Australia. It's already there. We should stop turning a blind eye and work to beat the scourge of smoking together. Thanks to vaping, my mum and my husband no longer smoke cancer-causing cigarettes. Vaping was the only thing that worked for me. I've been smoke-free for over six years and I feel so much better for it. I smoked for over 40 years. I tried everything to try and give up and nothing worked. Someone put a vape in my hand and I gave up overnight. Thanks to vaping, I can breathe again. I smoked for 30 years. I tried everything to stop. Then I discovered vaping and I haven't had a cigarette in 10 years. I quit cigarettes for good with vaping. I feel healthier and I no longer smell like an ashtray. Thanks to vaping, I don't smoke cigarettes that make me sick anymore. I could say a lot of things about vaping, but it just works. Within the space of a week, I just stopped being a smoker and started being a vapor. And over the last five years, my health has just gotten better and better. Since I've been vaping, my chest is clear. I no longer wheeze at night when I'm laying in bed. Um, four years ago, I picked up a vape. It was a vanilla custard flavor and I haven't looked back. I have not smoked cigarettes since. Then I'm gonna be able to watch my son grow to be a beautiful adult. The day that I got my vape was the day that I had my last cigarette. Thanks to vaping, there's no passive smoke harming my family. With vaping, I managed to beat a cigarette habit of 50 years. I discovered vaping and it was a miracle, absolute miracle. It's, I've now been free of cigarettes for more than two years. I recently met my first grandson, my first grandchild, and that to me was enormous considering I smoked for 50 years. Um, and now with vaping, I got to meet my grandchild instead of being dead. Simple as that. Hi, I'm Joe Hildebrand. I started smoking when I was 15 years old and I didn't stop for the next 25 years. Then when I turned 40, I realized it was killing me, but I still couldn't stop. Finally, I realized the only way I could ever give up cigarettes was by replacing them with something that didn't kill me. That's when I took up vaping and I haven't had a single cigarette since. That was four years ago. Not only have I not had any adverse health effects, but I've never felt better. I run every day, I feel fit and I feel fantastic. And so when people say that they're banning vaping because it will save lives, I say, you're just letting people die. Well, you've just seen how the landscape of the use of nicotine across Australia has, uh, has been very wide and varied. It appears that the government are even struggling to keep up with it as well. So much so that even as I was doing the final edit last night, that they've decided that they're going to put the nicotine ban on hold. Great news for vapors, right? Except they haven't really told people what's happening and when.
Essentially all those bands around state by state still exist. So, vaping and smoking and the use of nicotine is very, very complicated. It appears that the government can't get themselves over it. See, it doesn't have to be that complicated. As we've seen, it's a basic chemical to be used at low dosages. It can help people change their lives, help them quit smoking, and lots more. So, where do we go from here? Well, look, I think only time can tell. And it's just a matter of think just keeping an ear to the ground and being aware of this issue and being compassionate about the use of nicotine in Australia as it really does have the opportunity to save so many lives. Thank you for watching. Let's go to Sam the Vaping Bogan to get us out. It's time for our government to get themselves off of their own nicotine addiction and that is to the taxes to start putting their public's health first, to look at the facts, to look at the reality, to look at the UK, to look at our closest neighbour, New Zealand, and don't give me any crap about it's a different system, because it's not. It's the same fucking shit. Two Commonwealth countries, very similar governments, very similar populations, successfully implementing legalised nicotine vapour products. And our government wants to sit here and ignore it. Fuck you, Greg. Fuck you, government. Do your job. Do what you're there elected to do, and that is look after the Australian public health. And you're not doing that. It's disgusting. Can you hear a billion voices? Come banging on your door. You insist on making our choice. But it's us you choose to ignore But now we're getting stronger United every day You try to paint this picture To make us go away
But we find it hard to breathe We're finding it hard to breathe Trying hard to breathe We're trying hard to breathe